Can you tell us about your research and what you found? Is, is the sun entering into a dormant period? Well, it appears that way. We're in the minimum now. It may or may not climb out of it, but uh, I've been studying the solar activity. Uh, I started on this project, I think it was in uh, 1978 at Sonoma State University. Then it was Sonoma State College. Uh, my test scores were so high 99th percentile in the United States of natural science so they just said whatever you want to do we'll we'll pay you and give you the space so RCA provided me with the HF receivers I needed and I began a four-year study of that particular solar cycle that peaked around 1980 uh, during the time in which there was a total planetary alignment of all the planets in the solar system which had a rather pronounced effect on the Sun there was even a book written about it called The Jupiter Effect. But these were all things that I had learned in RCA, that RCA had been using radio astrology all the way back into the 50s, and even though the astronomers, you know, say that all of it's impossible, and get quite upset, sometimes even violent, if you mention such a thing, with the anti-Einstein. Uh, RCA was uh, doing it on a daily basis. I learned this from RCA you know, when I was an adolescent in high school. So I decided to duplicate all the exper experiments or observations at a time in which the sun was predicted to go nuts, which it did, and then had studied those cycles ever since until when my Landers facility got destroyed and now I have no more HF facilities other than what's in my car. So I have a rather complete research facility in my Toyota Corolla, so I can still kind of get an idea what the ionosphere is doing on a daily basis and, you know, whether there's an earthquake that's going to happen in the 12 hours or what have you. But, um, but what the politicized science is presently doing is all the weather data, uh, solar terrestrial data, and all that is being taken away from the public or deliberately distorted so that you can't get that information. How does radio propagation depend on the sun and the sun activity, and how is that measured? Well, the way the solar activity is measured is a specific wavelength is chosen, uh, 10.7 centimeters, which I believe is uh, 2,800 megacycles per second, microwaves, and they, there's a place in Canada that every day measures the power level at that frequency. So one solar flux unit is uh, one times 10 to the minus 20 second watts per square meter. If I remember right, I use uh, CGS units rather than MKS. So sometimes the centimeters and meters get mixed up, but they would tend to use meter. So right now the solar flux is about 70. Uh, as I received the information yesterday, and uh, the highest I seen it during my study at Sonoma State was 380. So the lowest I've ever seen it is 59. So after that particular solar cycle, uh, I forget the numbers of them now, cycle 22 was the one that I was mostly tuned into. Uh, after that passed, it's kind of the sun doesn't really kick up that much anymore, and there's kind of a generalized feeling that it's going into a grand minimum, which, if that's the case, people will be praying for global warming. Wow. And I believe um, in your research, you kind of came to the conclusion that the sun is, is transmitting from primary force to secondary force. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would see the sun as hollow. In fact, in my researches at Sonoma State, I used to get voluminous material from the Space Environmental Services Center that had images and pictures of the sun for every day, and they would send a booklet once a month with all of that in it. And the sunspots are actually holes that you can see inside, inside the sun. So there's a whole different dimensional coordinate reality inside of the sun sun is basically a transformer that's taking uh, the primary ether force, uh, for the lack of a better phrase, and turning it into 
something which is capable of measurement and perception. And then there's another stage of that where the Earth's uh, atmosphere or orgone envelope, you might want to call it, then turns that into visible light. And it's that envelope that the radio waves propagate through that allows the sun to influence that propagation. So basically, we're living inside a hollow sphere of electricity, which derives its sustenance from the sun. So when the sun does something, that hollow sphere of electricity that surrounds us goes into all kinds of different activities to the point where there's actually illuminations, which are generally called the aurora. Yeah. Now, I know you've spent a lot of time on on Tesla and how does our modern our modern system today differ from Tesla's telluric antenna system a lot of people think we should implement Tesla's system but from what I hear you saying it's nowadays that would be a complete disaster why is that well for one thing it can't handle the bandwidth gluttony and that's basically what destroyed Bell Telephone was the Silicon Valley crowd and their various activities and then getting everybody all, you know, addicted to this massive bandwidth consumption, which just continues to grow out of control, just like the size of pickup trucks are continuing to grow out of control, even though they don't carry anything. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, back in the days when the entire electrical load for a household was a 50 camp of power lamp, Maybe you could get away with transmitting the electrical energy through the earth, but now that we're up to the, uh, you know, the 10 gigawatt level, uh, that would be disastrous. It would probably trigger a number of earthquakes and destroy the earth. So the only really practical thing with the Tesla Telluric thing is for the scientific study, like using it as a radio telescope to listen to inside the earth. That's basically what I'm trying to get going here now with very little success because there's no interest in it anymore and I can't run back to the phone company or RCA to get any more materials. The other is uh, a backbone uh, emergency communication system so that if there ever is a complete nuclear holocaust, there's still a way to keep essential communications going without the associated bandwidth glut because there won't be people who have other things to do rather than peck on their devices <clears throat> trying to survive in an extremely hostile environment. So that would be a communication system that the military and the disaster control people could, you know, try to keep the situation going. And that, that has kind of been a theme in like some of these movies, you know, where the aliens take over the world and the only way that humans communi can communicate is with Morse code. Aliens have wiped out the whole communication system. Well, you know, the Russians or the Chinese could do the same thing. Just three well-placed uh, electromagnetic impulse in the United States, and that would pretty much be the end of everything. And with these telluric currents, uh, this appears to be the Earth's natural reservoir of organic electricity that actually encourages growth and living things as well. Is that true? Well, that's kind of jumping over a couple of steps. But um, you might say that the lightning that exists outside the surface of the Earth has a complementary lightning that exists beneath the surface of the Earth. And that is a lot of times what determines where the lightning is going to so-called strike the Earth, even though there might be a radio tower or something that Gary would say is a lot more inviting. It will completely go somewhere else and strike some particular rock in a canyon or what have you, because my observations with my radio telescope system, to work radio telescope system at Landers was is a lot of what goes on above the Earth has a mirror image beneath the Earth. Uh, tornadoes are one example of that. A lot of major lightning storms are examples of that. I would get one way, an overground wave and an underground wave, and then I could compare them with the equipment I had and I saw this uh, this complementary relationship between the inside and the outside of the Earth. And the uh, experiments that 
that my lectures and what have you have encouraged other people, ham radio people, to start experimenting, and um, and they're finding this to be true also with their ham radio transmissions. And there are some people now that have transmitted uh, considerable distances entirely through the Earth, vindicating the Tesla concept. And the signals are much clearer, and there's much less attenuation, and they're not disturbed by any kind of ionospheric uh, results of you know, nuclear or the sun or any of that kind of stuff that normally interferes with the ionospheric communications. Wow. Now, 